What a mixed story. What a difficult story. What a hard story. What a horrible story to have read here on the Sunday after Christmas, just a few days after the celebration of the birth of our Lord. We have to hear this difficult story, but it, it has so many images that we're used to seeing and hearing about at Christmas time. Most of the artwork depicts the wise guys coming to Jesus when he's in the, the stable. Most of the, the music that we sing tends to lead its, uh, its way towards seeing the coming of the three kings. We, we sing about three kings in Orient R, but you know, there, there is no reference in the reading today about three of them. There were three gifts, gold and Frankenstein and myrrh. <laughs> we had the three gifts, the gold, which is the symbol of Jesus is the king, the prince of peace. The frankincense is the incense that was used in the worship in the temple, indicating that he is prince of peace and God. And then the myrrh, which is a, an ointment or a perfume that was placed on the dead that was, uh, the dead were anointed with to prepare them for burial. We have these, in these three gifts three affirmations about the nature of Jesus. He is King, Prince of Peace. He is God in human flesh whom we worship. And He is to be sacrificed. We have in that story, therefore, even in the three kings coming to Jesus and placing the, the, the gifts at, at, at His feet, the three gifts. It could have been 30 kings, I don't know, but the three gifts. That in that story, we have the message, king, God, and sacrifice. But here we have in the story this awful account. The kings come, the, the, the magi come, they, they, they come to Herod the Great. They say, we, we saw his star, it's proclaiming the birth of a new king for Judea. Where is he? And of course, Herod wants to know. After all, Herod's in charge right now, and he doesn't want any pretenders for the throne. He doesn't want anybody to challenge him for rulership of Judea. In fact, he was murdering people who were uh, possible claimants to the throne, even though they weren't even saying they wanted to become king, even though they weren't even pretending as though they wanted to be king. If they had a chance at claiming the throne from him, he had him killed. So, of course, he wants to know where a possible pretender might be born. And they say, Bethlehem. And so we sing hymns at Christmas about Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. And we sing them with great nostalgia and sweetness. We want to think about Jesus being born there. We want to think about the shepherds coming in from the fields and, and, and telling Mary and Joseph about what the angel had said to them in the field about this baby. We want to talk about that scene, that story, what we got over in Luke. Or we want to talk about the Magi coming with their gifts. We don't want to talk about what then happens. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. Now, you don't want to make Herod the Great infuriated. Little note for you, Mark. Don't make Herod the Great mad. You just don't do it. As I said a couple of weeks ago, the guy was going absolutely stark raving crazy because his plumbing, yes, he had real indoor plumbing back 2,000 years ago. They still had it. And back then, they had it. And, but it, unfortunately, it was made out of solid lead. So he was going crazy. It was poisoning him. So he was already paranoid. He was already a megalomaniac. And yet, because he was going crazy, this word about a possible Messiah, this possible king to be born, infuriated him at the Magi and infuriated him at the city of Bethlehem. So what did he do? He sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under. Two years old or under. That kind of gives us our indicator that this event, this appearance of the Magi, besides the fact that it says that they visited 
Mary and, and the baby Jesus in a house, it's a pretty good indicator that this wasn't at the stable. This wasn't at his birth. This was some time later, up to two years, possibly, later. So depicting it at the same time as the shepherds and, and all, and, and wrapped in swaddling clothes, probably not. Two years later, all of the children, two years old or younger, are slaughtered. Now, frankly, history doesn't give us an account of this. We don't have anything in Josephus about it. We don't have anything in any of the other historians that talk about the era, that talk about Herod the Great, that talk about how horrible Herod the Great was. We have no indicator that he actually did this from their writing. However, the character of the man matches the deed. The character of Herod the Great lives up to the kind of depravity, the kind of evil that we see in this event. That you would murder all of the children, two years old and younger, in Bethlehem and in the surrounding area in order to try to wipe out a possible contender for the throne. Whew. Evil. Now, frankly, many of us have trouble talking about evil. We have trouble dealing with the idea of evil. Bad people, yes. Evil people, we, 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 we don't really grasp that. We have trouble dealing with that. We have the, the motion picture industry giving us our images of evil as, you know, uh, Dr. Evil from Austin Powers kind of evil. I want one million dollars. No. We make fun of evil. We make fun of evil. Because we have difficulty dealing with the concept. What is evil? What is evil? Well, evil is, is that which does this. Murders children out of fear of a possible future, probably distant future, successor. Ooh. The definition of love that I prefer is a good definition of agape from Greek, agape love, the highest form of love. And it's considering the needs of another as more important than or essential to your own needs. That's the best definition of love I know. Considering the needs, the wants, the hopes, the dreams of another as being more important than or essential to your own needs. In other words, your needs, your hopes, your dreams, your happiness is in part dependent upon the other person's needs, hopes, dreams, and happiness being fulfilled. That's a fabulous definition of love, of agape, of divine, of holy love. Considering the needs of another as more important than or essential to your own. Well, evil is the exact flip side of that exact opposite of that, the antimatter of that. It is considering your own needs as more important than anybody else's. And anybody else's needs, no matter what they may be, good, bad, or indifferent, are irrelevant. Your needs will be fulfilled without regard to right, to wrong, to the needs of another, to moral action, to moral principles, nothing else matters except you getting your way. Well, that's an awful broad definition of evil, Greg. Uh-huh. But it reflects the kind of action we have here on the part of Herod the Great. Wanting to get his way done without regard for anything else. Well, okay, Greg, we can talk about evil in the past. We can talk about evil in ancient history. Or we can talk about evil today, but a long way away, a far piece away 
uh, afar. Like ISIS chopping the heads off of ch Christian children. We can say that's evil. But right, what about right here? What about right here where we are today? Can we say that we know and experience and possibly even participate in evil? Yes. Yes, we can. We see it every day. We see it when we turn on the television set. We see it in the murder of young men on the streets. We see it in the murder, the execution of police officers sitting in their patrol cars. We see it in bombs being thrown, in people be, having their homes broken into and murdered overnight. We see evil in the action of others. We see evil even in our own inactions. Sitting back quietly. That's a long way away. Let's not deal with that. That's a long way away. It, it doesn't impact me. That's another state. It's not part of our rules. That's another situation. It's not part of my life. When we, by our inactions, when we, by our passiveness, when we allow evil to continue without at least speaking out we are participating in it and possibly even benefiting from it that's that's part and parcel of what's evil about racism friends you can be a wonderful loving person and not to have any active prejudices functioning against someone else and still participate in the evil and the sin of racism. Passively, inactively. It is so pernicious that you can, it can suck you in by thinking that's not happening here. We don't need to do anything about it. Oh, this is a story and this is a, a, a word I don't want to hear today. I want to hear about a stable. I want to hear about angels. I want to hear about wise guys bringing those gifts. I want to hear all that nice, mushy stuff. Sorry. Yes, the message of the Prince of Peace. Yes, the message of the birth of the Christ child brings love, hope, and peace. Brings joy. But it also brings us the reminder that evil will oppose the good news. Evil will oppose the gospel. Evil will oppose the message of hope. Evil will oppose the message of peace. Evil will oppose the message of joy. Evil will, op will oppose is in fact diametrically opposite from the message of love. Scripture constantly brings together this reality that evil is fighting against good. And the message of Advent and the message of Christmas is that the light shining in the darkness is not overcome by the darkness, but instead overcomes it with light, with love, joy, and peace, and hope. So we confront the evils of this world. We confront the evils of our own lives, our own selfishness, our own desire to get things done our own way. We confront those evils with the hope of the gospel, the hope of the good news of the Christ child, the hope of the good news of the Prince of Peace who comes to establish the kingdom of peace which is governed not by terror or force or will of power, 
but by love. The love of God, which establishes peace, establishes justice, establishes righteousness. The meaning of the word righteousness is inseparable from the meaning of the word justice. Both words in Hebrew mean balance. Tzedek means balance. And those things that are righteous are those things that are just. And they are things that are righteous just, balanced. Jesus brings in to us in His birth and in His kingdom, in His life, His ministry, in His death and His resurrection, Jesus brings to us righteousness, justice, balance. As we close out 2014, and as we step into a new year, let us do so proclaiming the good news of the balance of God in our lives, the justice of God, the righteousness of God in our lives. Let us begin the new year proclaiming the gospel, the good news of the love of God for all. Let us be about establishing the kingdom of peace right here in our own living in our own families, in our own lives, in this town, in all the circles in which we move and live. Let us truly be about establishing the kingdom of peace for the Prince of Peace. And let us participate in the gospel, not in the evil anymore. The gospel of peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2014 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.